perfectly on time <laughs> this morning. No, I suggest that tomorrow uh, you try to be at the bus uh, a bit early. This morning we decided to wait uh, a little bit longer because uh, we know that uh, the first time it's a, it's, uh, a bit complicated to, um, yeah, to arrive. But please, uh, tomorrow try to make an effort and arrive uh, in time for, for the bus. Like this uh, morning. Like this morning, yes, yeah. exactly. So, <laughs> so now, now, Paolo, you have 10 minutes uh, for your talk. <laughs> 10 plus 5, uh, 10 plus 5. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we have uh, Paolo Criminelli from, uh, from ICTP who will talk about uh, the EFT of the energy and gravitational waves observations. Uh, just one thing for, for the speaker. So we are going to record, <coughs> and uh, if uh, we don't manage to, uh, to record also the question, please uh, uh, repeat uh, the question uh, uh, during the, yeah. Okay, so thank you for, first of all, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, eff the impact of uh, recent uh, gravitational waves observations on uh, dark energy. This is a series of papers uh, um, with uh, Filippo, with Matt, who is the guy that we waited uh, uh, on the bus. <laughs> um, and then uh, um, Giovanni Tambolo is a PhD student uh, at CISA and uh, Vicerit is another PhD student that just uh, started. There is a, a series of papers uh, coming out. Um, so let me start uh, with uh, uh, something that we, we, we know quite well. So uh, recently uh, there was a revolution in uh, gravitational wave astronomy and uh, this one particular uh, piece of information uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the observation of uh, uh, a gravitational wave signal uh, with uh, a, an ele electromagnetic uh, counterpart. And uh, what is important about this graph is that uh, um, the gravitational wave signal uh, gets, uh, is uh, correlated with uh, an electromagnetic one uh, with uh, a, a delay of a few seconds, which is uh, related to the astrophysics uh, of, uh, of the event. And uh, therefore, this is a measurement uh, of uh, the speed uh, of gravitational waves uh, compared to the speed uh, of uh, light. And uh, I also uh, want to show that uh, in this plot, uh, the, the measurement uh, uh, starts uh, around uh, 30. I mean, it goes a bit uh, down, so it's, uh, it starts from uh, 30 hertz, just to give an idea of uh, uh, the uh, wavelength uh, uh, of the measurement. Um, so this uh, puts uh, severe constraints on the speed of gravitational waves. Uh, it's amazing that it's, it's with a single event, uh, we are able to constrain uh, deviation uh, from uh, in, uh, in the difference uh, um, of the two speeds uh, of order uh, 10 to minus 15. And this uh, is uh, orders and orders of magnitude better than uh, what was known before. For, what is relevant for the discussion later is that this measurement, uh, first of all, that uh, happens uh, over cosmological distances, or almost. So this, this particular event uh, is at uh, around 40 megaparsec, so it's, uh, um, it's uh, quite far away. Other events are even uh, uh, farther away. And what is relevant is that, uh, so we're talking about uh, something which uh, probably uh, uh, ha happens, uh, I mean, it happens uh, over the uh, unperturbed FRW. So in, some, in, uh, in good approximation, one can neglect uh, uh, non-linear effects uh, uh, which uh, takes place uh, around uh, um, the galaxy. And another important point uh, that I will discuss later is the fact that, uh, I mean, uh, we're talking about reasonably low energy. Well, of, of course, the low depends uh, on what you're interested in. Uh, but uh, for example, compared to previous uh, uh, bounds uh, on uh, gravitational wave uh, uh, speed, uh, this uh, is an event with a wavelength of over 10,000 uh, uh, kilometers. Okay. So this is, there is room for discussion, but uh, okay, it's uh, uh, reasonable uh, to, uh, to, to discuss uh, these events uh, within uh, the same effective theory that we use uh, to uh, interpret uh, uh, cosmological measurements. I will discuss this uh, in, in a second. Okay, this does not, in, uh, it's a slide that does not need uh, any word. So most likely the, the, the universe is accelerating uh, because of a cosmological constant. But uh, anyway, it's something that we want to, to, uh, to test. And uh, why the uh, gravitational waves uh, are relevant uh, in this context? Uh, well, because uh, uh, in da whatever dark energy is, uh, it's, uh, it's a medium uh, which usually, okay, it's not a rule, but usually breaks uh, uh, Lorentz invariance, okay? So basically what I, I, I want to advocate uh, is, the, is the very simple idea. So since now we are 
uh, flowing gravitational waves uh, through this medium, okay? uh, we can constrain whatever this medium is uh, through gravitational wave measurements. For example, I already talked about the speed of gravitational waves. So in general, the speed in a medium is different uh, from, uh, from, um, from, the, from the speed in, uh, in the absence of the medium. Um, but also other, other effects can take place. For example, uh, gravitational waves can be absorbed by the medium. Uh, they can have a dispersion, so they can have a non-trivial uh, dispersion. Um, they can interact uh, with the excitations of the medium uh, in the same way as light uh, interacts with uh, uh, phonons uh, inside a material. So all these effects, uh, in principle, can be, can be used to say something about uh, uh, dark energy if uh, it is not uh, as simple as a cosmological constant. So this is the general um, setup. So I'm going to use, uh, uh, for, um, to describe this uh, system, uh, the effective theory of dark energy. Uh, which uh, started uh, uh, many, many years ago, uh, Alberto, many years ago. Um, and it has been developed by many people in the audience, uh, most uh, notably by uh, Federico and, uh, and Filippo and uh, many others. With, and there are also some, some other um, approaches which are quite similar, uh, so I don't, I, I mean, the, the references are incomplete. So um, I think that I don't need to explain too much, so the idea is, is, is quite simple. Um, so we want to, so first of all, we choose uh, some uh, class of models of dark energy, the ones uh, which are uh, uh, characterized by a preferred foliation, uh, which, uh, for example, uh, uh, when you have uh, an evolving, uh, a time evolving scalar field, uh, you have a preferred foliation of your uh, cosmology. And uh, um, so the idea is to write down the most generic action uh, describing uh, a system with these symmetries in which there is a preferred foliation of space time. And uh, therefore, you write uh, an action in terms of objects uh, which are invariant, uh, not under the full uh, diffeomorphism, but only under the, the, the diffs uh, which preserve, uh, uh, which, uh, which preserve this, uh, this foliation. Um, in particular, I, I, I do uh, the choice of uh, uh, assuming that there is a universal coupling, uh, in the sense that the standard model and dark matter couple to the same metric. And this metric is the metric uh, I, I use, the metric I, I, I write the Lagrangian for. OK, so this is, is a mess, so I will uh, explain in a second. But so the idea is, uh, uh, so people played a bit, and uh, they, they write down a quite generic uh, uh, action for this, uh, uh, for this theory. Um, and uh, OK, so let, let, let me explain. So th there are many parameters entering here. So one, one thing that I want to, to notice is that uh, um, you can, uh, so these, uh, these operators, they have mass dimension. If you prefer, you can use uh, dimensionless variables, uh, properly normalizing these coefficients, okay? And you have these uh, uh, coefficients called uh, usually alphas. And why they're relevant? Well, because uh, um, these dimensionless coefficients more or less tells you the deviation from uh, uh, lambda CDM, so in principle, you want to, to use uh, observations, uh, for example, uh, uh, the futuristic large-scale structure observations, uh, to constrain uh, all these dimensional parameters uh, appearing in these Lagrangians. And usually, okay, uh, I mean, you are interested uh, for those kind of uh, experiments, you are interested in these parameters to be of order uh, 10%, 1%, because this is the level at which you can test uh, uh, gravity. Okay, let me explain uh, some of these uh, parameters, uh, if uh, you're not. Uh, so the first three terms uh, uh, represent uh, uh, um, a branch decay theory. So there is a, a possible no minimal coupling in front of uh, the einstein hilbert term. There is, uh, this describes uh, a minimal quintessence model. So this describes uh, uh, the possibility of uh, changing the speed of propagation of uh, uh, the dark energy perturbations. So this is what uh, you would call k essence. Then the, there is this operator, which is uh, typical of uh, DGP or the cubic Galileon or uh, braiding, which is uh, basically the same thing. So it's, uh, um, and then, uh, uh, so notice uh, all the operators I'm talking about, uh, they are up to quadratic, okay? So also these operators are quadratic and they describe uh, uh, theories uh, which uh, Galileons, uh, uh, Hordensky theories, uh, and uh, uh, also beyond Ordensky theories. So I will explain in a second uh, what this is. Uh, and so these are all uh, up to quadratic uh, terms. From here on, uh, you have uh, operators which are uh, uh, of uh, cubic or higher order. 
So these terms are not relevant if you're interested only in linear perturbation theory, but they become relevant uh, if you want to study the nonlinear evolution of structure, uh, in particular the Weinstein mechanism. So here I focus on the, the terms with the highest number of derivatives because they are uh, leading uh, when you study uh, screening. And sorry for the, for the people, uh, just to remind you, uh, what, what does it mean that this Ordensky theory? Ordensky just means uh, um, the most generic uh, uh, scalar tensor theory with the second order equation of motion. Uh, people uh, also realized uh, that uh, you cannot go beyond Ordensky. Um, uh, you can uh, have a theory, so what does it mean beyond Ordensky? It means uh, a theory which uh, still propagates uh, a, a single scalar degrees of freedom uh, on top of the graviton. But uh, it has more than two derivatives in the equation of motion. The reason why this avoids uh, the Ostrogansky uh, theorem is that uh, it's the general theory, in the sense that uh, uh, the second derivative of a Lagrangian with respect to the, um, the, the, the canonical variable is, is zero. So it's a degenerate theory, so it can avoid uh, uh, the existence of a ghost. Uh, and this is the context uh, uh, I want to work with. I'm, 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 again, there is no theorem about this. So people also study theories, uh, for example, the Gauss condensate or other gravity in which uh, uh, more derivatives appear, okay? And you can apply the same game, but I will restrict to this uh, uh, for most of my talks. Um, so if, if you choose to be in this class of theories, there is a relation uh, among these coefficients. So this uh, relation and this relation. Otherwise, uh, all the coefficients are, uh, are free. And in general, also time dependent. Okay, so why well, let me, maybe for, for people that are not so in, in the field, let me give some examples. So, so first of all, people will say, okay, why you are you're looking at these theories? Yes. Uh, is there, uh, can you say that? So is there a subset of these uh, parameters for which, uh, which are stable under the RG flow, for which your effective theory is closed and such uh, is self-consistent at different scales? rather than looking like a tuning. Uh, what do you mean by tuning? Well, um, usually in effective theory you select parameters and kill others by selecting by symmetries that respect the RG flow. Yes. So, so I'm, I'm I will not if there is a subset, which I would say is more interesting than the world set that you're considering, which is stable under the RG flow. Well, what I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, this because uh, Enrico is uh, probably mentioning this. Uh, so, but uh, what, uh, um, so let, let me maybe, should I repeat the question? No, because there was the microphone. Okay. So let me answer this, uh, showing this slide. So you can ask uh, in the covariant language, uh, so uh, let me be, be brief. So you can ask, uh, okay, I have this coefficient, but uh, uh, what is uh, a possible range of uh, uh, parameters which is relatively uh, stable? In a sense, I take an action and uh, I compute uh, uh, loop corrections and uh, the loop corrections are, are, are not big compared to to the tree level, uh, taking into account uh, uh, non-normalization uh, non theorems. Uh, and uh, uh, people, uh, uh, Filippo and, and friends, and uh, Rick and friends, uh, they show that uh, there is, uh, for example, a, 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 a choice of these uh, um, scales, lambda 2 and lambda 3, such that uh, this theory is relatively stable, uh, I think, in the sense that, that, uh, so, uh, that, that you mentioned. Usually, people. Uh, discuss, uh, I mean, okay, this is a, is a possible uh, uh, setup, uh, which is radically stable. And uh, uh, maybe, I don't know if, if I answer uh, your question, but um, it, it, yeah. It so this is an example of a subset. This is, 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 is exactly, exactly. Notice that uh, it's, uh, it's based, uh, as you said, uh, usually one uses symmetry to, to constrain the, the, the shape. And uh, it is based on, uh, on uh, a Galilean symmetry, which is, uh, weakly broken, and then a shift symmetry. Okay, so these, two these are the two symmetries at play. And basically, in some sense, uh, these are the two scales uh, of breaking of the two symmetries, uh, so that this uh, system is consistent. This is called weakly broken uh, Galilean symmetry. Um, OK, so let me do a couple of examples. Because uh, um, I, I want to, to think about this uh, uh, crazy theory, crazy set of uh, parameters. But to me, uh, it's similar to doing uh, like a post-Newtonian uh, test of gravity. Okay? So I don't think that uh, when, when you talk about post-Newtonian test of gravity, it's not that uh, 
most of the people will not think that uh, once you test this, uh, you will find something different from GR. So there are examples, uh, but uh, um, so I think it's, it's an arena to test the possible uh, effects uh, that may deviate from, from uh, standard uh, GR plus a cosmological constant. And for example, in studying in details these operators, you find effects that uh, I think uh, you, you will not uh, otherwise have uh, uh, thought about. For example, uh, uh, people, uh, um, I was talking about this operator, which induce uh, uh, what is called braiding. Braiding is, uh, is, uh, is a, a mixing between uh, uh, scalar and, and gravity, but a mixing which is different from the usual uh, branz dickey uh, mixing. In fact, in this case, uh, the two Newtonian potentials are the same. Okay, so this is one example. Another example uh, comes uh, when you go beyond Dordensky. This is an operator, which is typical of beyond Dordensky, and uh, it induces uh, a modification of uh, um, uh, of uh, the Newtonian potential inside the matter, okay? It's due to the mixing between uh, basically uh, these, uh, these the potentials and, uh, um, and matter. So it's called kinetic matter mixing. So anyway, this uh, changes, for example, the structure of stars, and you can put constraints on this uh, looking at, uh, at this. But without any details, I'm just saying that this is a good way to find the possible uh, phenomena that uh, you may not have uh, uh, thought about. So why this has to do with the uh, gravitational waves? Well, let me start with the simplest example. Um, so this uh, operator induces uh, a speed uh, of uh, gravitational waves, uh, which is different from uh, the speed of light. So this operator is the extrinsic curvature squared. The extrinsic curvature is basically gamma dot. So it's, uh, it modifies uh, the time kinetic term uh, of the graviton. Okay. So there's no surprise because, as I said, uh, we are uh, intrinsically studying something which breaks uh, spontaneously Lorentz invariance. So in principle, uh, there is room for a speed uh, which is different from, uh, from, uh, from, from unity. So the, the, con the constraints that we saw at the beginning, that we said that uh, this operator must be very uh, small, very, uh, I mean, when I say small, it means uh, small compared to what I can measure using, I don't know, Euclid or other uh, uh, cosmological probes, okay? So we're talking about 10 to minus 15, so very, very small compared to these uh, uh, possible measurements. So this is killed, but also you can, you, you can say, okay, um, I, I don't want uh, that uh, the speed of gravitational waves uh, is exactly the, the one of uh, uh, light uh, only on our precise uh, FRW solution. So, it, it, for example, if I start modifying a bit the dark matter abundance, uh, I start uh, changing uh, these, uh, these coefficients, okay? And I want uh, this, uh, uh, this feature, since it is so precise, to hold also if I change slightly the cosmological background. Or uh, I want that uh, the, the, the speed of uh, photons and gravitons is the same also when they travel inside the gravitational potential, okay? Because, of course, observations are also sensitive to the propagation, not uh, on FRW, but also in a perturbed FRW. So if you, if you put these constraints in, uh, and uh, you, so you kill uh, many other operators, uh, and you set uh, these two coefficients to be the same, okay? So th this was realized uh, soon after the discovery, but anyway, the, the message is that uh, if you impose uh, the two speeds to be the same, uh, also around uh, a generic background, uh, you're, you're left with uh, a much simpler action. So let me mention uh, an important caveat uh, that, uh, uh, that um, Scott and Claudia uh, pointed out, which, which is the following. Of course, I'm assuming uh, that uh, the theory I use uh, for cosmological observations um, can be used also to describe uh, um, the propagation of uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, with uh, a wavelength around 10,000 kilometers. Now, this uh, need not be the case. So the cutoff of these theories uh, is around, uh, is quite close, is around 1,000 kilometers. But of course, uh, I mean, uh, the, the theory can change much below the cutoff, so new states can enter, and uh, um, the theory may, may, may change. I mean, uh, um, this is an important caveat. Let me, let me stress uh, one thing. So if, uh, if you want, uh, so the picture would be that uh, uh, the observation at LIGO are uh, at uh, short scales, in, qu in quote, so that uh, the speed of gravity can come back to the speed of light uh, on short scales, uh, like it happens in a material. So at very high energy, the speed comes back uh, to, the, to the speed in vacuum. Okay. So this is possible. Notice that uh, since the measurement is very precise, it, it probably means that you need uh, uh, new physics uh, at very, very large scales. Okay. 
I, I would estimate uh, something like this because usually the, sp the, 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 um, the, the speed comes back to unity quadratically in the frequency. So if you this estimate, uh, you need some new physics uh, around this scale, uh, 10 to the uh, 11 kilometers. Now, of course, this means that we don't really know what happens beyond this scale. So uh, um, at a scale shorter than this. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, I don't know how to interpret all the tests of gravity in the solar system in this, uh, in this context, but this is a caveat. So maybe we can find a UV completion such that uh, uh, everything works. Okay? And, uh, and this is, uh, is, is a caveat that we have to keep in mind. So let me skip this. So this is, uh, is uh, reproducing basically the same thing using not the effective theory, but the covariant language using Ordensky beyond Ordensky. You get the same answer, so you can skip. I, I, I'm also going to skip uh, uh, the issue about relative stability, something that uh, I said a bit uh, to, to, now, to answer uh, Brando. Um, so there are many symmetries in, in place, and uh, uh, maybe Enrico will mention uh, uh, about this. So anyway, w what is the key point? The key point is that uh, I impose the speed of gravitons to be equal to unity. Well, the first thing that I have to check is that this statement is relatively stable. Okay? Because if I, if I, it's a very precise uh, constraint, 10 to minus 15. So I want that this statement is, uh, is stable under relative corrections. It is, okay, it's not, uh, uh, it's, I mean, as far as I know, there is no symmetry, but uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, you can check that uh, the, 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 the normalization is small, is over 10 to minus 40, actually. So, it's, um, so I can impose this constraint and the theory remains uh, stable. Okay. So at least it's technically natural to do this. Let me move to another, um, um, another observation. Um, not, uh, so I said that, uh, in general, I expect also uh, gravitons uh, to be absorbed in a material, like photons in, uh, in a medium. Um, in particular, uh, so pi is uh, the excitation of the dark energy. So it's like the phonon of uh, dark energy. So here we are in, pre in the presence of uh, uh, two massless particles, uh, the graviton and, uh, and pi, the, the, the dark energy excitation. So in a Lorentz invariant theory, the only way for uh, a massless particle to decay is to decay collinearly. But actually, this kind of decays are not really decay. They are more like a, a, mix, a mixing of the two. I mean, it's, it's like a change of what we call asymptotic states. Uh, but this uh, only, is only true in the presence of uh, uh, Lorentz invariance. In the absence uh, of Lorentz invariance, uh, here we are in a medium, so Lorentz invariance is no linear realized. It is possible for a graviton to decay into two uh, pi's, uh, which are dark energy fluctuations, uh, or uh, a diagram like this. So this, uh, in particular, you can check this uh, looking at uh, this operator M4 tilde. Why this operator? Well, because uh, I said that uh, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm left with this operator with this coefficient set to equal to this uh, because of this uh, constraint. So I'm looking at this uh, uh, particular operator. And uh, I can uh, quite easily calculate what is the, this vertex. So there is some issue of gauge invariance, constraints, and so on. But uh, um, you get uh, a, a coupling, which is gamma double dot di pi dj pi, which mediates this decay. So this is subdominant. You can calculate uh, the, the three level uh, decay width. And you see. Since uh, this uh, cutoff, uh, I mean, now, we, we, I mean, of course, uh, we need to, to specify the, the coefficient. But uh, um, if you impose that uh, the, the lifetime of the graviton is of order uh, cosmological distance, uh, you get uh, a bound on uh, this ratio, which is of order 10 to minus 10. Okay? So just to tell you, again, what, what uh, one can hope to measure in uh, Euclid or something is something of order uh, 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 2. So here we are talking about uh, something which is uh, very, very small. Okay. Okay, so the, the so, uh, one, one caveat is that uh, this uh, channel is open only if uh, the speed of pi is less than unity, kinematically, okay. which is usually is the case. But uh, uh, on the other hand, if you take uh, this to be exactly luminal, uh, this uh, is, uh, is not uh, possible kinematically. Another thing that uh, this uh, coupling uh, induces, uh, if, you if you basically take this diagram and you close the loop, uh, you also get a dispersion. Okay? So you get a modification uh, to the propagation uh, of gravitational waves. In particular, you can calculate uh, the, the logarithmic uh, divergence of this diagram, which is uh, calculable. 
and you get uh, a dispersion proportional to k to the 8. Um, and also, this is uh, constrained experimentally, because of course uh, we see the signal coming uh, to, to LIGO and Virgo, and uh, it's compatible with the expectation, so we don't expect, uh, we don't see any large uh, dispersion. So this, uh, the, the bound uh, on, uh, on this effect uh, is very similar to the bound uh, we get from, uh, from the decay. In other words, we don't see neither a decay nor a dispersion of the, of the graviton, so we can put bound uh, on this uh, operator. Okay, of course, uh, the two are related by the optical theorem. Okay, one, no one thing to note is that, of course, uh, I am generating higher dimension operators. Okay, so I started with the Ordensky theory, but of course, uh, there is, I mean, it's just a starting point. You are going to generate higher dimension operators, uh, as in any effective theory, and uh, you have to take this into account, and in particular, they induce uh, uh, dispersion. Let me skip this. Uh, okay, this is, um, again, uh, talking about uh, loops, but uh, let me skip. <coughs> and let me now come uh, to, um, to another uh, process. So now I studied the, the perturbative decay of a graviton into uh, dark energy uh, fluctuations. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, this uh, is an approximation because uh, I'm not in the presence of a single graviton. I am in the presence of a large uh, gravitational waves uh, with a large uh, occupation number. Okay. So, so let me focus uh, on another operator, this operator M3. But, uh, mm, I mean, I could do this. I mean, actually, I will do the same also for M4 tilde. What is important is that uh, this operator contains a coupling uh, gamma pi pi. Uh, in particular, it's uh, gamma dot di pi dj pi. So in the equation of motion for pi, I have uh, this object, gamma dot di pi dj pi. So now, gamma is a large classical wave. Okay? So we are in a situation which is similar to what you study, for example, when you do preheating. So you have a classical background, and you're looking at uh, perturbations uh, which are uh, induced uh, by this uh, classical background. Okay. So I treat gamma as, uh, as a classical background, and I look at what pi does. So I have an equation of this form. And uh, it's similar uh, to a material equation, in the sense there is uh, a, a term which is oscillating in time. It is different because uh, now it's a wave. It's not something which only oscillates in time and not in space, like at the end of inflation. But it is uh, a wave, a classical wave. Now, what, what you can do is, is, uh, is uh, use the following trick. So uh, the speed of, uh, of pi, we assume that it's uh, different from the speed of uh, light. And uh, uh, notice that this has nothing to do with the speed of gravitational waves. So this is the speed of dark energy fluctuations. So and we take this to be less than, than unity. Then uh, you see, from, from the point of view of uh, the pi cone, OK, which is this, um, this uh, is a time-like uh, um, variable. So basically, I can use the different uh, variables and recast these exactly in the usual Mathieu equation. Okay? Like, like, uh, um, and uh, so I, I am in the presence of parametric resonance. So the equation uh, for the modes uh, of pi can be cast in the usual uh, Mathieu form with the parameters a and q, which are written here. So a and q depends, uh, of course, I have the, my, my wave, which is traveling. And uh, the, the, the resonance will depend uh, on, uh, not only on the, on, the, on the size of the mode, but also on the direction. Okay? So notice that the coupling uh, is not the usual, uh, so it's, it's a derivative coupling. So it's, uh, it, it's not this, I mean, it's, uh, um, okay. um, so mathematically it's the same, but uh, it's slightly different. Um, so the, here is the usual uh, um, instability plot. So there are bands of instabilities. So the, the goal would be, I calculate, I look at the instability, and then uh, I produce these pi's, and the pi will back react uh, on the gravitational waves because they have a uh, uh, stress energy tensor, and they will change uh, the gravitational wave uh, signal. Okay? So schematically, so they, they change, so, they have, uh, so this is the projector transverse traceless, and this is uh, the effect of pi on the gravitational wave. So you can do this calculation. Uh, um, at least uh, in, uh, in several points, so for large uh, uh, times. So you're dominated by the fastest uh, growing modes. Okay? Um, and you get uh, an answer, which is uh, the modification of a gravitational wave signal. Okay? 
Now, um, let me, I mean, it's, it's a long story, but let me make it short. So, uh, so the modification of the gravitational wave is in the same direction, and uh, it has the same polarization. An interesting thing is that uh, the leading uh, harmonic, so the leading instability, uh, has the same frequency as uh, the original gravitational wave. But there are also corrections to this uh, at higher frequencies. So what, what you do is that you generate also harmonics uh, of, the, of the incoming gravitational wave. So these uh, harmonics, uh, since they have a higher frequency, they would come uh, into the bandwidth of your experiment uh, before the leading uh, signal. So we call them precursors. Okay. So we didn't study yet uh, whether this is measurable or not, because of course there are post-Newtonian corrections with the same uh, features. But anyway, this is, uh, is uh, so the, the leading signal is the modification of uh, the main uh, frequency, but there are also these uh, uh, harmonics. So actually, this is, uh, is, is OK, but is, is uh, not uh, true, um, in the sense that uh, there is an effect that we have to take into account uh, that is very important uh, and changes completely the pictures uh, in some cases. And uh, the effect that uh, I overlooked uh, is uh, that uh, the pies uh, that I produce, uh, they also interact uh, among themselves. Okay? And so what happens is that you, know, you generate these pies, uh, which grow exponentially. But once uh, they start interacting among each other, they will uh, spoil uh, the resonance. Okay? We didn't start, I mean, this is, is probably impossible to study analytically. But uh, people study this uh, in, in the pre-eating literature. And in general, you find that uh, when the interaction uh, among uh, modes become relevant, uh, the resonance is uh, stopped. Okay. Um, so I, I was looking at this term, but there are also interactions. And notice that uh, for the M3 operator, the, the, the cubic galileon, the scale which suppresses uh, these uh, is much lower than the one uh, we were looking at. So to make it short, uh, for the M3 case, uh, probably, although we didn't do simulations, uh, most likely the resonance will be uh, quenched. And so there is a negligible effect. On the other hand, uh, I can uh, still use the, these, uh, these calculations for the operator M4 tilde, the same operator I was studying before. In this case, uh, of course, I'm, I'm interested in very small couplings now, because uh, uh, the perturbative decay already put constraints. Now I, I'm looking at uh, the coherent effects. So in this case, what happens is that these two operators, uh, uh, the, the self-interactions and the, the resonance, uh, they have uh, a similar scale, a scale which uh, for small couplings is much larger than, than lambda 3. Okay. Okay, I have to make it short, but anyway, you can estimate what is the effect of these uh, um, nonlinearities. There is also a, a cancellation. So we're looking at uh, a particular Galilean structure. So it's a particular interaction among the modes. It turns out that uh, at the leading order in the saddle point, uh, it vanishes. So it turns out that the kinematics is such that uh, uh, so there is a further uh, um, cancellation. Anyway, so you can estimate uh, what is the effect of these uh, nonlinearities. Uh, and you get a bound. In a sense, uh, you cannot have uh, an arbitrarily large uh, modification of the gravitational wave signal. But uh, you, you need to satisfy this bound. So this bound is the bound in which uh, uh, no linearities uh, can be neglected, so you can trust uh, the growth uh, of the resonance. So now you can put everything in, in, in plot. Okay? So uh, this is alpha h, is our uh, coupling. Notice that uh, we already constrained this coupling to be smaller than 10 to minus 10 because of the perturbative decay. Now, uh, so this is alpha h. This is the distance. Uh, at which uh, the resonance, uh, the, the conversion uh, of uh, gamma into pi is occur. So these are the various bounds. Uh, sorry, I didn't say, sorry, let me, let me come back, so I didn't say this. Uh, I'm working in narrow resonance, okay? So narrow resonance means that uh, uh, the, the forcing term is small, is a small perturbation which grows exponentially, but it's small compared to the rest of the equation. So I didn't study this uh, regime, okay? So this is one, so I'm interested in the blue region. So narrow resonance is below this line. The bound uh, on, on uh, uh, non-linearities uh, that I just described uh, means that you have to, to, to be above these lines. And this is uh, to have some uh, uh, reasonable signal, some modification of the gravitational waves, you, have, you need to be above this line. So in conclusion, this is for, for LIGO-Virgo, so it's a, in, in, an event of this um, uh, sort. 
you, can, you have a sizable modification of the signal uh, inside this uh, region, so, so for these values of alpha h. And this is the same for a futuristic uh, LISA, uh, which covers another range of parameters. So you see that uh, uh, so we are constraining these parameters uh, at a level that, uh, um, that is uh, not, uh, I mean, it's completely, I mean, it's orders and orders and orders of magnitude better than what uh, a large-scale structure experiment can, uh, can do. Um, the last slide uh, is about uh, going in this region, so the region uh, which is not a narrow resonance, the region in which uh, uh, the gravitational wave uh, affects, uh, of order unity, the, um, the, um, the pi uh, equation of motion. So this is uh, the equation of motion. So I'm, I'm going to a regime in which beta is large, uh, is larger than unity. Okay. So you see, what happens is that basically you have a gradient instability. Because, uh, uh, I mean, let me, so these oscillate, but if I look at the modes which are very short, this basically acts like a, a constant, and uh, in some direction, uh, some mode will, be, will have a gradient instability. So if you put the numbers, uh, this happens uh, for realistic uh, gravitational waves uh, for uh, values of N3, which are uh, interesting for large scale structure experiments. Okay. So this, this uh, uh, instability is there. Now, just to remind you, uh, so this is a, a nonlinear instability. So it means that uh, around uh, a nonlinear background, so around a, a given background, the theory of perturbations becomes unstable. So this, uh, for example, has to be contrasted with what happens uh, um, with the cubic Galilean. If I forget about gravitational waves, I, I only look at uh, uh, cubic uh, Galilean interactions. So in this case, uh, if you, if you take a, a solution, a nonlinear solution, for example, a Weinstein solution, and I look at small yes, um, you can study whether the, the perturbations described by this matrix Z are healthy or not. And there is a nice uh, old result of uh, Alberto and Ricardo saying that this matrix uh, cannot uh, flip sign. So if it is healthy at infinity, it remains uh, healthy. But this does not happen once you take into account uh, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, okay. What does it mean? Okay, this instability, we don't really know how, how pathological it is because uh, uh, it's an instability at the cutoff. So you are going to generate modes uh, close to the cutoff, but these are very short scales. Uh, so, very, sorry, these are short scales, um, but uh, again, it's a, it's a small amount of energy. So it's something that only the UV completion can address. So we don't, uh, so this anyway, it's, it's work in progress. I'm skipping some subtlety that maybe I can discuss with, uh, with Alberto. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the more or less the, 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 the result at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but it, but the level of asymmetric, it is, sorry, it is very dumb. <laughs> at the level of S, <laughs> hello. Uh, sorry, at the level of S matrix, it is clear that for CS to unity limit, everything should just vanish, the radiation in the pi. But uh, when you're doing this uh, kind of semi-classical computation, is it just evident that uh, if you send CS to um, one? No, 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 it's not evident and it's not a dumb question. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. Uh, the reason is the following, that uh, for CS, uh, uh, so I remind you that uh, I use this trick uh, that uh, when CS is smaller than unity, I can, uh, so basically, if CS is, is smaller than unity, uh, the gravitational wave uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is time-like, so it, it, I can recast it in, in, a mature, uh, uh, in the form of, of, of a standard material equation. If CS is equal to unity, I don't really know how to deal with this equation, because now I will have uh, uh, the pi waves, the gravitation, gravitational wave, they travel at the same speed. So to be honest, I don't know how to treat the problem. Uh, we didn't think too much about this, but no, it's a, it's a good question because I, I, I need these uh, to uh, be, be recast these in the standard uh, uh, in the standard form. So I don't I don't know the answer for CS uh, equal to unity. Uh, that was it. So I, I studied a few um, few uh, phenomena which all have to do with the fact that uh, gravitational waves propagate in a Lorentz violating medium. So they, they are uh, absorbed, they have a different uh, potentially, they have a speed which is different from the speed of light, they have a resonant uh, uh, production of uh, uh, phonons of this uh, medium. Uh, and this, I think, uh, it puts severe constraints on, on the theory. Of course, this issue about uh, whether the use of the same theory 
used for cosmology for this uh, phenomena is, uh, is, is viable. Notice that uh, in, the, in, the, in the last few slides, uh, I was uh, using uh, a regime uh, in which alpha h is very small. So the cutoff now is much higher than lambda 3. So from this point of view, it seems that, uh, OK, of course, you can always break the theory much, much before the, 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 the cutoff. But uh, I mean, in principle, this seems uh, uh, something that can describe uh, these events. But this is uh, still uh, uh, something to, to study. OK, I stop here. Thank you. OK, we have time for um, maybe a couple of questions, very quick questions. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering, uh, as far as I understand, all the terms you considered are parity preserving. I was wondering why, I mean, is there any reason to keep them like that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I know the answer. Uh, No, no, there is no, uh, I, I think at, uh, at this level of derivatives, uh, there are no parity uh, odd terms. No, I mean, there is no, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that at the level, if, if, if you stick to um, a theory, a scalar tensor theory with second order equation of motion or uh, beyond the desk, there are no parity odd terms. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Filippo can correct, uh, but they are not. So of course, uh, you can go to look at higher order terms, uh, and uh, there are also parity violating ones. But uh, at this level, I didn't impose parity, but it just comes from the fact that there are, I impose, uh, which, uh, I impose a second order equation of motion, and this uh, kills all the parity breaking terms, if I'm not mistaken. But I think it's true. OK. Hey, Paolo, uh, when you talk about the resonance effects, is relevant when you have large number of uh, gravitons, right? Yes. So does it mean most of the event occurs very close to the source? Is that what it means? Yes, so it's, uh, I, I skipped many details. First of all, uh, when you go very close to the source, uh, there is also the Weinstein effect. Uh, and the Weinstein effect uh, kills, uh, so the, the usual uh, Weinstein suppression uh, kills uh, these, uh, so there is a Z denominator of these, uh, yes, here. So here I will get uh, a Z denominator. So, uh, so yeah, so, so, so it's quite complicated. So close to the source, uh, you have Weinstein. Then, uh, then you enter in a regime in which probably you have this uh, regime of instabilities, which uh, is sort of UV sensitive. And then far away, you are in this regime in which you, you really generate a large classical nonlinearities that you can calculate and look at uh, that reaction. But yes, so it's a. Uh, so when you do the uh, perturbative computation of the gamma decay, so the effect is uh, the, the rate is suppressed by y minus c squ cs squared squared. But I assume it's because uh, in the cs going to one limit, the decay is collinear. And so you have a particle, a, an elicity two particle that cannot decay collinearly into elicity zero particle. Yes. So in that case, in that limit, aren't you dominated by the other channel, Cherenkov radiation of pi, in wi which is still allowed in the collinear limit? Uh, yeah, I don't know. But probably, do you remember? Um, Yes, so uh, y y I don't see any reason why this, the other one, uh, um, but uh, l let me say, so the, the second channel is, is really parametrically suppressed in the sense it's suppressed by uh, the scale lambda 2 and not lambda 3. So it's still true that uh, it will be dominant, uh, but uh, uh, well, it's worthwhile seeing now. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's parametrically smaller, but I don't see any reason why it should vanish in this limit. So it's maybe interesting. OK, thank you, Paolo. Let us thank Paolo again.